Welcome, everybody. My name is Scott Delp. I'm a professor of bioengineering, mechanical engineering, and orthopedic surgery at Stanford University. I'm thrilled and honored to be part of this uh, fantastic symposium being organized by the NIH. I'll focus today on understanding how we might accelerate rehabilitation with big data. The explosion of smartphones and wearable devices to measure movement presents new opportunities to understand the relationships between physical activity, environment, and health on a planetary scale. In my talk today, I'll share some of the work we've been doing with my colleague, Yuri Leskovec, to make sense of massive, noisy data from wearable sensors. Some of the questions I'll discuss are, to what extent can we trust the data from a smartphone app or wearable? And what insights can we gain into mobility and physical activity from people around the world in free living settings? And finally, I'll end by addressing how can we use wearable sensors and video to measure rehabilitation outcomes and how can we move the field forward? My typical approach has been to use research grade sensors in a controlled laboratory setting to measure human movement and rehabilitation outcomes. So for example, we might put EMG electrodes, wearable sensors, force plates. We can even develop computer models that give us insight into the underlying musculoskeletal dynamics. And analyses such as these have really been the mainstay of movement science and have led to great insights on a movement in a variety of conditions, stroke, Parkinson's disease, cerebral palsy, and will continue to be very important. But now we have a new opportunity, commercial devices that are inexpensive and ubiquitous from Fitbit, Zumio, Apple, Lumo, that can measure devices 24, measure motion 24 seven on a much larger cohort. So what can we learn from these new massive data sets? What can we trust and what, where should we be asking significant questions? The data that I'll share with you today comes from a smartphone application in which uh, we recorded the motion of 2 million users worldwide. That constitutes uh, over 74 million days of step tracking at one minute resolution. So there's about 100 billion data points. We collaborated with a local company called Zumio, and we are really fortunate to have them as collaborators to, to share the data with us. So the research questions we sought to answer are, does the distribution of physical activity within a population matter for public health? What are the relationships between your environment, the built environment, where you live in activity in different population subgroups? And can we trust the findings from smartphone apps? Where is the data good? Where is their signal? And where is their noise? And how do we go about finding signal within the noise. We first wanted to know, are we only capturing young male early adopters in Silicon Valley that's using this technology? So we just analyzed the demographics. What we see is that half of our users are female and that's equivalent to the US census. The mean age of our population is 35 years, whereas in the US it's 37 years. But we have a big cohort of individuals, 40,000 uh, people over age 60. There are 29% roughly of the subjects in our data set who are obese. The CDC reports the US has a whopping 36.5% of obese, but we still have many uh, individuals with a BMI, body mass index, over 30 in our population. So we're not exactly representing the US, but it's, uh, it's certainly not all young, healthy male Silicon Valley um, early adopters. So the next question we asked is, can we produce, reproduce the trends that have been reported before? For example, it's re been reported in surveys of physical activity that it's lower in women, lower than the elderly, and lower in individuals who are overweight or obese. And here's the results from our 2 million users. So what I'm plotting here is daily steps versus age. And you see that um, number one, steps decline with age, 
that males in on average take more steps than females and that it declines with body mass index. So what I'm plotting here is daily steps again versus body mass index. Healthy body mass index here is between 18 and 25. And as you uh, become overweight and obese, the number of average daily steps decreases. So we can reproduce known trends and that's good. After these and many other tests, we could look not just um, in, in a worldwide population to look at average daily steps. And there's big variance between uh, individual countries. We had um, hundreds of countries with over 100 users, but a smaller number with over 1,000 users. And that's the set of countries I'll analyze in this presentation. So we can dive a little deeper and look at the distribution of activity within a country. So uh, if I plot the steps for four characteristic countries, so Japan, the United Kingdom, US, and Saudi Arabia, you see that some countries like Japan take more average daily steps than Saudi Arabia. But you can also look at the variance. You see Japan, they take a, a greater number of steps but also they're more tightly distributed. In Saudi Arabia and in the US, there are individuals who are activity rich. They take much more than the average, but there's also millions of people who are activity poor. And we wanted to know, is this distribution activity significant? We see that there's inequality in physical activity, and this might make an important difference in public health outcomes. So we looked at, activity inequality and its relationship to obesity. So what I'm plotting here is uh, activity inequality. We measure this in exactly the same way that you would measure income inequality. And we looked at the fraction of individuals within a population that's obese across a variety of countries. So for example, in China and Japan, there's low activity inequality, low variance of physical activity, and a lower fraction of the population, just above 5%, that would be classified as obese. In Canada, Australia, the US, there's much higher activity inequality and a higher fraction of individuals who are obese. Now, activity inequality indeed accounts for a greater um, set of the variance than does just the average activity within the population. So that was interesting that we have a, a powerful variable to account for this one important public health outcome. Are these results robust to income status? So we have a high income group and a middle income group. Unfortunately, in this data set, we do not have a low income group with a sufficient number of individuals. But you can see that for high and middle income, the activity inequality and fraction of individuals within a population who are obese is indeed uh, found in both these populations. What about, uh, is it robust to gender? And indeed it is. The, uh, here we have for female and for males, there's a strong relationship between activity inequality and the fraction of individuals who are obese. So, Another interesting finding is that when activity inequality is high, women are most affected. And you can see this, here's the average daily steps per day and in activity inequality. And you see the slope is steeper in women. So as activity inequality goes up, they pay a bigger price in terms of their average daily step count. And what this tells us is that when activity inequality is high, it's accounted for mostly by activity poor women. And if you look in populations where there is high activity inequality and many in women who have uh, high activity, um, high inactivity, you see that the women in that population pay the price in terms of lost life years. We also look at this, the relationship between steps and obesity is also stronger for women than men. So what I'm plotting here is the percent of individuals within a population that is obese and average daily steps. And what you see, of course, is a steeper relationship. As average daily steps go down, you have a steeper rise in the percent of the population that is obese in women over men. 
So the key findings are that activity inequality is a stronger predictor of obesity prevalence than just average activity levels. Activity inequality predicts obesity across age, gender, and a country's income status for middle and high income. There's a gender gap that drives almost half of the activity inequality. So how does the built environment, where you live, and whether you can walk safely in your environment affect activity inequality and public health outcomes? We used a separate data set that characterized how walkable environment is and found that it's linked to lower activity inequality. So what I'm plotting here is the walkability of US cities versus activity inequality in that city. And what you see is as walkability goes up, New York being a highly walkable city, activity inequality goes down. In other metropolitan areas, Fort Worth, Texas, San Antonio, it is much more difficult to walk in those cities and the activity inequality and obesity is higher in those cities. So walkability is certainly linked to lower activity inequality and lower obesity. Well, are these results robust to income level? Uh, indeed they are. What's plotted here is in these different colored lines, we used uh, data for mean household income, and you could see this activity inequality and walkability relationship holds in these uh, lowest income range that we plotted. It's a less strong relationship, but it did hold for these uh, higher levels of income status. It was interesting to find that activities higher throughout the day and throughout the week in walkable cities. So, uh, during weekdays, what you see in highly walkable cities, you see between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m., you can see kind of the morning commute, and be around between 5 and 7, you see the afternoon commute, you see people going out to lunch. Uh, and in low walkable cities, you see, you don't see those uh, activity bursts in the morning and evening, you see a little bit at lunch, but it's uh, lower throughout the day. The same is true on weekends. So what I'm plotting here in the green is the average steps per 30 minutes on the weekend, and it's higher in these 10 most walkable cities and lower in these 10 least walkable cities on the weekends as well. So activity is higher throughout the day and throughout the week in walkable cities. Interesting, walkability is associated with more activity across all SOAP groups, but especially in women. So what I'm plotting here is how many steps you get per degree of walkability, so the delta steps per point of walkability for uh, a range of ages and a range of body mass index here. And across all of those, for each increment in walkability, the uh, female subjects get additional steps greater than the male subjects. But you see across all ranges, increasing the walkability of the city and across all BMI, uh, you see increased uh, steps per degree of walkability. So this can inform public policy on how to create environments that promote public health. So the key findings here is higher city walkability is associated with lower activity inequality. In more walkable cities, individuals move more throughout the day and throughout the week. And walkability is associated with more activity across age, gender, and BMI groups. So how can we advance movement science and rehabilitation science with big data? I was thrilled to when the NIH came out with a call for proposals to compete for centers that would evaluate real world rehabilitation outcomes and even more thrilled that we got to establish the Restore Center. This is part of the Medical Rehabilitation Research Network, the MR3 network. And the goal of the Restore, Restore Center is to create a worldwide collaboration to collect data and gain insight from real world data on rehab outcomes to advance the delivery of medical rehabilitation for individuals with impaired movement. We're one of six centers in the MR3 network. And our vision is something like this. We have 
we established this worldwide network of individuals, for example, who are studying low back pain or post-stroke rehabilitation or research teams looking at osteoarthritis, Parkinson's disease, fall risk in elderly patients. Each of these groups is collecting data and rather than keeping that data isolated, we provide a portal for individuals to share the data. Once we have data, we're also providing tools for individual research teams to analyze that data. I'll provide a little bit more information about what tools we're providing, but they fall into the category of analyzing wearable data to understand biomechanics and machine learning methods to analyze very large data sets. This is supported by the National Institutes of Child Health and Human Development, and also NINDS under the P2C program as part of the MR3 network. And I encourage all of you to learn more about this network. It's an incredible set of individuals and centers that are trying to provide a variety of different tools for the rehabilitation research community. At the Restore Center, our team includes expertise in statistics, computer science, bioengineering, wearable sensors, and clinical rehabilitation. I'm pleased to join with Martin Landsberg, Matt Smook, Trevor Hasty, Jen Hicks, and Joy Koo to bring resources to the rehabilitation community. Well, what resources will we bring? There's a set of didactic interactions, boot camps that provide hands-on training to advance your individual project. So how can you go about data collection using wearable sensors? How can you use machine learning to analyze this? What statistical tools are available that might be helpful? We have virtual office hours with experts to guide your research planning and a knowledge base that provides data and resources on the best practices for using wearable sensors to evaluate rehabilitation outcomes. We also have pilot funding and a fellows program we provide a set of seed grants for up to $30,000 for 12 months to enable you to generate pilot data for a bigger proposal. To leverage the expertise of the community, we're establishing a fellows program where individuals with expertise around the world can share their expertise with new investigators who are getting into this field. And finally, we're developing two key te technologies one has just been released, an analysis of videos for GATE, where we are enabling individuals to get key biomechanical measurements from simple 2D videos. And we've posted this here, and you're welcome to uh, check out the gatelab.stanford.edu for more information. We've also just released OpenSense. This is an open source tool for gaining biomechanical measures from wearable sensor data. It's freely available software that you can find at simtk.org. I welcome you to connect with us in the Restore Center on the web or Twitter or by email or simply reaching out to me, Scott Delp at stanford.edu by email. Thank you very much for your attention. I really uh, look forward to your questions and the discussion. Thank you.